Welcome to Daybreak Australia. I'm Paul Allen in Sydney, where markets have just come online. I'm Annabelle Drawlers in Hong Kong. We're counting down to Asia's major trading opens and our top stories this hour. Asia set for a cautious start after US stocks barely extend record highs. China's boldest moves yet to stop a market round facing a wall of skepticism from investors. Netflix rising after the bell on its best customer gain since the pandemic surge. Meanwhile, Texas Instruments gives another lacklustre forecast. Plus, Bloomberg learns that Apple is dialing back its decade-long ambitions for a self-driving car as a release date continues to slip. All right, uh, we've just opened for trade here in Australia, as Bell mentioned, and we're a little bit to the upside here in the very early going, better by a tenth of one percent. Of course, we do have that staggered open here, so let's see how the morning unfolds. But uh, following on from uh, some modest gains for most of the U.S. markets, not a great deal of movement in the bond space here at the moment. Uh, yields just creeping up ever so slightly, and the Aussie dollar's been moving a little higher as well. Uh, right now, uh, 65.83 against the greenback. We do get some. Data out of Australia a short time ago, uh, Judo Bank Australia PMIs, uh, that showed some improvement as well. The composite number 48.1, so we're still uh, below 50, uh, but manufacturing PMI has moved above 50, a reading there of 50.3. That's a partial read for the month of January. Uh, New Zealand has been trading for a little while now. We got some uh, CPI data out of New Zealand a little bit earlier too, some encouraging numbers there, uh, slowing to 4.7% on year in the fourth quarter. That was in line with expectations and are slowing a bit sharper than the RBNZ expected. So that suggests that uh, the hiking cycle in New Zealand is probably over. Uh, we've got uh, the market uh, in New Zealand uh, moving a little bit, uh, a little bit to the downside there. Nikkei futures setting up for another positive day. Uh, the yen still very weak at 148.36. China futures in the green as well. And of course, Bell, we've uh, seen uh, Chinese stocks selling off very, very heavily. The CSI at a five-year year low, although we are reporting that uh, there's going to be a $278 billion stabilization fund uh, to get on top of uh, this market route bell. Yeah, well, Paul, uh, big gains still. We're seeing a pretty different story for U.S. stocks because yesterday the, the S&P 500, the Nasdaq 100, uh, hitting fresh record highs into the close there. So in futures, you're continuing to see that climb. Uh, there's the focus, of course, on the New Hampshire primary to wait for. There's as well the, the, the bigger focus perhaps coming down to earnings. A pretty mixed bag during the session. We had United Airlines, Procter & Gamble among the gainers. Uh, but let's take a look at after hours as well because there's a focus on, on Texas Institute instruments. Pretty weak forecast from the company, so you can see that stock is continuing to slip in after hours. Netflix, though, really the one to be watching as well because it's jumping. Uh, subscriber growth, that topped estimates, so a very strong surge. Best numbers we've seen since the early days of the pandemic. Uh, the other one to watch as well was was its continued foray into, into video games. That's something to note, but also a, a, a new direction of sorts because Netflix acquiring those rights to, to world wrestling entertainment programming, Paul. Yeah, Netflix, uh, very rich news flow coming out of the moment, so as you mentioned, acquiring those rights uh, to WWE programming. This is its first big move into live events. Uh, Bloomberg Intelligence says its solid results show a new advertising tier and paid sharing initiatives uh, are working as well. The senior media analyst Gita Raghunathan joins us now more to unpack these results. So uh, Gita, strong fourth quarter from Netflix. Uh, question is, can it keep this going into 2024? Yeah, it was a near perfect, uh, you know, scorecard from Netflix, uh, whether it was the subscriber momentum and all of the other financial metrics as well. And going into 2024, yes, we are definitely going to continue to see growth. I think the one standout that we saw, Paul, from the earnings report was their operating margin guidance. Uh, and, and, you know, they were guiding initially to about 22 to 23 percent for 2024. They actually moved that up to 24 percent. So just kind of goes to show uh, that they have, you know, all the stars are kind of aligned for this whole Netflix bull thesis to play out. Uh, and that's exactly what I think we're going to see happen in 2024. Yeah, and, and the big focus as well, Gita, was on on the the step that, that Netflix is taking in a bit of a new direction here. It came ahead of the earnings results, but essentially this $5 billion bet on live events. We heard from the, the Netflix co-CEO in the earnings call. Take a listen. 
Live event programming is something we've talked about for quite a while, and this has been in the works. So you should look at this as fits inside of our $17 billion programming spend now. I would not look at this as a, a signal of any other change or any change to our sports strategy. So acquiring those rights to Raw, to, to other programming from world, world Wrestling Entertainment, is that something that helps Netflix, do you think? I think it absolutely does. I mean, they've been kind of, uh, you know, experimenting with different content genres. Live sports is not something that they had really ventured into so far. But I think now that they have an advertising platform, now that they are selling advertising, uh, you know, it, it definitely makes sense for them to go after sports because, you know, with sports, you know that that content really plays well and it really attracts a lot of ad dollars. It, ad, it attracts a lot of ad, advertisers to the platform. Uh, and, uh, you know, what they need to do now is to kind of really invest in their content. And that is what this WWE deal really helps them do. Uh, uh, you know, invest in content, kind of get the scale up of the ad based users and then be able to actually sell all of that ad inventory to the advertisers. It's not cheap content, though, is it? The WWE deal about uh, five billion dollars. Does this suggest going forward there's going to be uh, a risk of higher content spending from Netflix? Yeah, so they were asked that question. I mean, yes, it is $5 billion over a span of uh, about 10 years. So that's about $500 million every year. Uh, they said that it's actually going to be within their content budget. So uh, this year they're projecting about $17 billion in content spending. They did say that that will inch up, uh, you know, a little bit as we kind of get into 2025, 2026. Uh, but they, don't, they didn't, uh, you know, project any massive increase in spending. And they said it's going to be in a very, very disciplined in a very, very cautious and measured uh, manner. Yeah, well, investors clearly liking these results because Netflix continuing to surge in after hours. That was Gita Ranagathan, our Bloomberg Intelligence senior media analyst there. Uh, let's switch to, to somewhere that's going in, in perhaps a bit of an opposite direction. China planning to stem the current stock market route and that, that move or policy push is facing a wall of scepticism. We had earlier reported that authorities were considering a rescue package that's backed by $278 billion. Our executive editor for Asia Markets, Paul Dobson joining us now. Paul, we did, of course, well, not of course, but we did see a bit of a move higher for, for some Chinese equities off the back of this. But the big question of Mark of really is whether that can be sustained. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the the uh, um, sort of uh, immediate knee-jerk reaction is uh, a bit of short covering, uh, a little bit more optimism to more the, towards the market. Yes, OK, uh, there's signs that something is finally going to be done uh, to help the market out at the very least. But uh, after that immediate sugar rush and the rebound that we saw yesterday, what investors now want to see is one, confirmation of this news, and two, what else is there? You know, investors don't just want support supportive measures for the equities market, but they also want supportive measures for the economy. Most importantly, the property market in order to start getting consumer confidence back in China to break the kind of disinflationary mindset that we've slipped into over the past few months and to really uh, kind of uh, get growth, get spending going again. So that's kind of the, the longer term play uh, that investors are looking for. There's also, uh, to be honest, like the skepticism about how effective this can be long term. Uh, in any case, we've had many efforts by China over the years to try to prop up the markets previously. And we found that if it's not supported by more fundamental changes, then uh, after that sort of runs its course or even as it's sort of uh, dribbling through, uh, the market can start to turn against uh, China again. Yeah, Paul, you mentioned uh, words like skepticism, confidence. It's interesting that about 60 percent of stocks in China are held by retail investors. And considering they've not had a great experience with the property markets, uh, how confident can they be that these measures are going to work? Yeah, and I think winning over the, the domestic audience is important in this because we've seen so many stock links, mutual funds closing down, liquidating in recent weeks and months, uh, that that's added to this selling pressure that we've seen on the overall gauges. People switching instead into the safety of government bonds or, or uh, picking up a little bit of extra yield in corporate bonds. Uh, consumer is very burnt. The, uh, the man on the street is feeling uh, pain at the moment, is looking for bargains, you know, which is why we're seeing the price wars among the car retailers, among the, uh, the, the sort of um, big 
uh, retail chains as well. Uh, so turning that around, flipping that mindset and re-establishing that confidence is really the sort of uh, key to solving this from a market's perspective at least. Now, uh, the authorities may think the growth is still going at 5% a year. That's fine by us. We're happy with this and we don't really need to do more. And so that's the kind of conundrum. If, if they feel that really uh, there isn't a need to, 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 to sort of um, uh, propel markets or propel consumer confidence further uh, at this point, then um, probably this stimulus will only last for so long. All right, executive editor for Asia Markets, Paul Dobson there. Well, a new poll suggests Donald Trump has gained most from the exit of Ron DeSantis from the Republican presidential race, opening a 22-point lead over Nikki Haley. Voting is now underway in New Hampshire's primary, where Haley's the last major challenger standing between the former president and the party's nomination. Bloomberg's political news director Jody Schneider joins us now from Manchester in New Hampshire. Uh, so, Jody, why is the New Hampshire primary so significant and how unusual is it for this to be effectively a two-person race at such an early stage? Yeah, Paul, it's very unusual for it to be a two-person race. Uh, I think the last time there were about uh, 10 people in it at this stage. So uh, Nikki Haley had said she wanted a two-person race. She's getting a two-person race. But, of course, with the challenger like Donald Trump, it's an, it's an uphill fight for her. We've heard uh, today uh, reports of pretty strong turnout, particularly among more moderate and independent-minded voters, which will help her because those are the kind of voters uh, that she appeals to. Uh, and she also appeals to voters who don't want to vote for Donald Trump. So uh, we will see the polls close. All the polls close here uh, in a, more than an hour. And uh, we will then get start getting the results. She needs to have a very good night tonight uh, to make it, uh, to really have that kind of momentum behind her that will continue to make this a, a, a successful or at least an interesting two-person race. She said today she was going to stay in the race to South Carolina, that she will not be dropping out, although others who have dropped out have said be uh, sometimes just days before that they were going to stay in the race. Yeah, so what, what do you think is going to really constitute a success for Nikki Haley tonight? What's sort of the, the bottom line going into it? Maybe she doesn't win if she gets close. Is that something that's still seen as a positive or enough? Well, if she wins... Yeah, if she wins, that certainly sets up a whole different dynamic, and that really kind of um, makes this, uh, you know, this continues, this battle with Donald Trump. And, of course, that's what her campaign hopes. Uh, New Hampshire has, it's famous for giving, uh, for surprising, for really um, having a, a different result than the polls had shown. However, um, some analysts we've spoke to today said they think if she's, obviously she'll be second uh, if she doesn't win, but that if she comes in a strong second, say within five percentage points, that that's a good showing and that she can say that shows that she can be competitive to Donald Trump, that he is not uh, the effective uh, nominee at this point. If she does, uh, she trails him badly in second place, that isn't a good sign. And the next big race is South Carolina, which of course is her home state, but Donald Trump is already doing very well there. Yeah, so Jody, what happens after tonight? As you mentioned, Nikki Haley says she's going to stick around until South Carolina, regardless of what happens. But, you know, at least one of these candidates has some legal trouble, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. Uh, and Donald Trump does face uh, legal troubles in a number of jurisdictions in federal and state court, 91 uh, indictment counts. But um, he has also been able to kind of make that part of his campaign. He's basically uh, goes from the campaign trail to the courthouse uh, pretty seamlessly in, in, at the courthouse saying that he is uh, being targeted, that this is uh, a Justice Department controlled by uh, Joe Biden that is trying to keep him out of the race. It doesn't want him to be president, and he fundraises off of that. So, uh, so far, we haven't seen the um, his legal troubles really affecting uh, his popularity with his base. Although in New Hampshire, we've talked to some voters who said that if he were to be convicted of a crime, that they might have trouble with that. So, I think that's where that will start showing up more. But what's next is the next big race is South Carolina, and then we'll have Super Tuesday in March, where a number of states vote. 
Yeah, but polls closing for this this primary in just under two hours' time. So that was our Bloomberg political news director, Jody Schneider, joining us from New Hampshire. And we're going to have special coverage of the primary taking place beginning at 8 p.m. Eastern time. That's midday in Sydney, 9 a.m. in Hong Kong. So special coverage coming up later. Uh, still ahead, sources say Apple is pushing back its self-driving car ambitions as it continues to delay a launch date. Plus, we're going to hear from Evanist on why they think mega caps have returned to the driver's seat. This is Bloomberg. You're watching Daybreak Australia, taking a look at some of the big movers in the session intraday because we're seeing futures pushing higher but the focus really coming down to earnings and, and what companies were signalling about the outlook. So United, for instance, one of the big gainers posting an outlook that beat. Uh, Procter & Gamble as well, their, their profit outlooks really helping offset the slower sales growth that we're seeing for the company. So both of those among the big gainers intraday. To the flip side, we had the likes of Johnson Johnson, for instance. It, it's, uh, it slid. Device margins dropping drug sales as well seen falling. 3M, uh, that's, that's the most that we've seen it down in almost five years and it was a disappointing outlook for the company. After hours, again, it's a pretty mixed bag coming through, but two of the ones we're really watching in particular. Firstly, there's Netflix uh, really rallying because it's user numbers indicating further support for the company. Uh, most subscribers we've seen signed up to the streaming giant since the days of the pandemic, the early days as well. Texas Instruments, meanwhile, a bit of a weaker forecast, so one to really be watching, especially with those uh, chip makers that are listed here in Asia. But Nasdaq futures, again, uh, can continue continuing to push higher. So it does indicate just how much optimism is already being priced into stocks. Uh, let's get more on that now. Our next guest says the recent moves in U.S. equities show mega caps are back in control, particularly tech. With us now is Dana Dioria, co-CIO at Ever Investnet. Dana, lots of moves we've seen really starting back in October of last year. Do you think that it's going to really live up this earnings season to sort of some of the hype and the positivity that's already been priced in at this point? Well, I think so far we're seeing that maybe we're not getting that right. So, I mean, we're only a week in. Um, it's kind of early days to, to make predictions, of course, but I would say that thus far, at least what we've seen is maybe a little bit more lackluster than where we started the year. Um, growth expectations uh, for the S&P 500. Not to say we're not going to get, you know, 2023 double digit, um, you know, at the end of the year, uh, I think that's a foregone conclusion. But um, you know, not not certainly not surprising greatly to the upside. And you know, only a few sectors kind of um, possibly maybe beating where the estimates were in January. So I think you know, it's not a bad earnings season by any stretch that's in front of us. But it's not anything that's sort of uh, greatly surprising people in a positive way. And if you think about the fact we came into the year with pretty high earnings multiple in the S&P 500 19 times, uh, you know, there's not a lot of room in there, right, in, the, in terms of the pricing uh, for anything other than, you know, fantastic surprises to kind of uh, positively impact the market. Yeah, so when you sort of couple that and then you've also got expectations for Fed rate cuts that are being pushed back, what does that tell you about the trajectory of the, the bull market that we're seeing then? Is it something that's going to start to fade perhaps? Yeah, I think there's a case to be made for that, for sure. Um, you know, we, we we did, we came into the year with a lot of abulians, right? And so, you know, again, multiples being where they were, and and you're right on it, right? Uh, rate cut expectations have dropped pretty dramatically. We we were looking at 60 plus percent rate cut uh, likely in in March, and and that's just come down, um, you know, pretty significantly, which shouldn't be that shocking, right? I mean, the Fed, you know, notwithstanding some of the dovishness that we heard at the last OMC meeting, um, they have expressed the desire to kind of stay higher for longer. And when we look at what's going on in the economy, certainly unemployment, um, inflation's kind of coming in as a mixed bag, you know, a uh, little bit maybe higher than expected, but core kind of where we expected PPI a little lower. I think, um, you know, to a certain extent, the Fed is empowered to sort of just sit where they are. And that's what they've said that they wanted to do. So I don't think it should come across as such a surprise to markets in March. Uh, but it does seem to be, you know, taking a little bit of the edge off the, the excitement we entered the year. 
Uh, Dana, in terms of markets, we have seen uh, tech leading the gains again. Uh, small caps continue to lag again. I mean, how long do you see this trend continuing uh, before this rally starts to broaden out? <laughs> It's all around multiples. So first of all, we have to see where tech comes in and earnings, right? I think there's, you know, there, it's sort of the this asymmetric possibilities, right? With tech, there's this the possibility that you get great news around AI that kind of blows out expectations, and you really don't have that, uh, you know, that kind of potential upside with other sectors, right? There's there's nothing kind of hovering that could potentially, you know, really boost other sectors the way some of the tech companies could come in and talk about AI again and, and we could have this massive uh, boost. But I do recommend um, tilts towards small caps. So you mentioned small caps. We know December small caps came roaring back. They got a lot of the return that they had gotten for all of 2023. And I think there's a very strong case to be made that wh whether you think that they're going to win in the short run, they do over the longer haul, particularly if you stay away from the very low profitability kind of growthiest lottery ticket like small cap stocks. You stay away from that area of the market. Small caps do tend to outperform over time. And they're nice also, particularly small value, they're a nice hedge against inflation, uh, which we don't, we, we really don't know for sure that we've completely conquered, right? We know that inflation tends to come in waves. So I think not not that you're gonna have a small cap portfolio, but when you're thinking about tilts in the portfolio, having making sure that your full market, that S&P is not your entire uh, holding, I think makes sense. Just very quickly, Dana, 30 seconds. What's your cash allocation? I think cash is, should be coming off a little. Obviously, you hold what you need to hold, but I think a lot of people held maybe way too much cash last year. They saw the opportunity to lock in great rates, but it didn't come anywhere near what equity markets did. All right, Dana Dioria, co-CIO at InvestNet. Thanks so much for joining us. We have plenty more to come on Daybreak Australia. This is Bloomberg. OK, let's take a look at how we're doing on markets at the moment here in Australia. We saw modest gains to the upside, about a fifth of 1%. Gold mine is doing pretty well. And the lithium miner Liontown resource is also in positive territory after having a, a rough week or so. Uh, we're just getting some data out of Australia as well. It's the Westpac leading index for December. Uh, slight contraction there, very slight though, um, of 0.04 of 8%, reversing the gain uh, for that index that we saw back in November. The New Zealand stocks, meanwhile, are backing off a little by a third of 1%. We had CPI numbers out of New Zealand a bit earlier. Uh, inflation slowing pretty sharply to 4.7% on year in New Zealand, although that was in line with expectations. Nikkei futures looking kind of flat at the moment. Uh, the Nikkei has been performing very strongly of late, as we know, and the E-mini S&P futures are trading uh, modestly in positive territory at the moment also. Now, let's get back to one of the top stories out of the US in terms of earnings, Netflix. Very strong report, signing up more than 13 million customers in the final three months of 2023. And that's his best quarter of growth since viewers were stuck at home in the early days of the pandemic. Now let's bring in Jamie Lumley, now senior analyst at Third Bridge. Uh, Jamie, thanks so much for joining us. Just take a look at some of the highlights there. Strong subscriber growth, 13.1 million signups. That was a beat, a beat on sales as well. What were the key takeaways for you? So the key takeaways on this is really that Netflix knocked it out of the park. I mean, if we break down the various sets of numbers here, Netflix saw double-digit revenue growth. It saw an operating uh, margin, which other streamers are going to be envious of. And in the subscriber number, as you highlighted, this is one of the best quarters in years, seeing growth not only in its core U.S. and Canadian markets, but also in Europe, Asia Pacific, Latin America all seeing remarkable year-on-year -year improvements and also demonstrating that key initiatives such as the launching of the ad-supported tier and also the crackdown on password sharing has really taken effect for the company. So it does beg the question though, where's the growth going to come from in future quarters? How does Netflix keep this momentum going? Do you think we're going to see perhaps some price increases? 
Well, we think about pricing, Netflix looked at it in a couple of different ways last year. There was initially the crackdown on password sharing in around end of Q2, early Q3. Um, and that was viewed in some ways as a bit of a price hike by management or another way to do that. And then the announcement uh, in Q3 that they would be driving up prices. So this is something which could perhaps temper growth as certainly more cost conscious customers uh, may be less inclined to go with some of those plans. But also let's keep in mind the ad supported tier at seven bucks a month is a fairly competitive price level if you think about that versus a number of the other offerings in the U.S. from Disney, Warner Brothers Discovery, or Paramount, for example. Uh, so while there could be some, you know, impact from more price hikes, given what's already happened in the state of the landscape, uh, it's not necessarily going to be a major headwind for the company going forward. You mentioned the crackdown on password sharing and how that sort of helped boost subscriber numbers, but how much more can Netflix mine that sort of revenue strategy to, to as well? It's a great question. And if we think back to before Netflix started this off, they estimated that there were 100 million households which were sharing Netflix accounts. And if we look at the growth numbers over the past two or three quarters, uh, it still hasn't gotten close to that 100 million total. What we've been hearing here at Thurbridge from the experts we speak with is that Netflix could likely in the mid to long term tap into 50 percent of those households. So if we think about the progress the company has made, it's still only scratching the surface in terms of that subscriber growth potential. And then there's the question of, of other revenue streams. We know one of them is, is the gaming offering. So how much is Netflix really committed to that area, do you think, so far? Gaming is definitely interesting because if we think about this and leadership highlighted this during the earnings call is the fact that gaming still represents a very small fraction of overall spend at Netflix and also is still relatively low in terms of the percent of its base which engages with games. That being said, this engagement has been growing. It tripled in 2023. Although it is coming off of a relatively limited base, those are still remarkable numbers. What we've been hearing uh, from our experts is that it's unlikely Netflix will make any major moves in gaming in the near future, preferring to either build internally or grow through smaller acquisitions, picking up small studios versus something major, and really continue to figure out the best ways to continue to engage its base uh, while also uh, capitalizing on the IP they have to create just another way uh, to monetize you know, the hit shows and films that the platform brings to people. Well, Jamie, we're seeing their Netflix rising after hours about 8%. Uh, over the past year, Netflix shares better by 35%. Uh, how much more upside is there here? Well, if we think about where the company is today, it definitely seems to have picked up a lot of momentum in terms of revenue growth and subscribers at the end of 2023. As we head into 2024, uh, if we look around the industry, profitability is still key, and Netflix uh, is definitely far and away above the competition. Players like Disney, Warner Brothers Discovery, uh, Paramount are still trying to crack the code on getting profitability to work, whereas Netflix is there and is working on optimizing their margins. And as they look forward to changing their content mix, moving more from their traditional scripted shows uh, into live programming, changing how they're thinking about their investments and in content, uh, this could have an impact on their cost structure. So if we think about uh, what's in store for Netflix, there's still definitely levers that they can pull to really to uh, continue to improve their bottom line, uh, improve their positioning as a company. Yeah, you mentioned live programming because that was the big news ahead of the earnings was that they were paying five billion dollars uh, for, for Raw as well as, as well as other programming from WWE. Was that a prudent decision, do you think, to, to again, as you said, to sort of diversify its content, or do you think it's something that's a very, very expensive price tag? So the WWE is definitely interesting, and it's a big deal. $5 billion over 10 years, starting in January of 2025. Uh, but also on top of that, it's getting international rights. It has rights to a couple other different uh, shows from the WWE. And it is a lot of programming. It's an, uh, weekly shows for an entire year. It's many hours of content it'll be able to bring to its platform, which is also quite different from the type of content that they have. So this, from Netflix's standpoint, 
could be an effective play to both broaden their appeal to an ever widening breadth of people while also finding new ways to engage its existing customer base. Because at the end of the day, subscriber growth is certainly incredibly important for Netflix, but keeping the existing subscribers there, not having them become serial churners, switching in and out depending on whether their uh, favorite show is on the platform, having this sort of recurring content, this live must watch TV uh, is definitely something which Netflix thinks will be a good investment for the future. All right. Th thanks for your insights. That was Jamie Lundley, senior analyst at Third Bridge. Well, we also heard from the WWE president, Nick Khan, about that $5 billion deal. He says Netflix's bet on wrestling will benefit both companies. We're pleased with the deal, and we love the fact that Netflix was willing to take a bet on us. As we know, they had said previously that they were not into sports rights. The good thing about WWE, it's sports entertainment, as you said before the quick break there. So we're an entertainment property as much as we are a sports property. 52 weeks a year live, consistent programming, an audience that is actually quite global. If you look at India, and India is not part of this deal, but if you look at India, we're the second most popular sport in India. If you look at the United Kingdom, we're the fourth most popular sport there. This deal will take effect in the UK. So in addition to the United States, it allows us to gain even a greater global footprint as we look to expand the business. Well, Nick, I want to talk a little bit more about the decision to go with Netflix, go with a streamer versus staying with a Comcast, for example. Did this purely come down to numbers where you were going to get the better deal or is this in effect a bet on where the future eyeballs are going to be? Well, look, we continue to love NBCU. We have SmackDown on USA premiering this October there. We have our premium live events, formerly our pay-per-views, like WrestleMania on Peacock exclusively in the United States. They've been tremendous. For us with Raw, it was yet another test of someone new in the space, obviously an established streaming entity, the streaming entity, if you will. It was a good bet by us, and we think a good bet by them. Let's talk about ad pricing a little bit more here. Does this give you greater ad pricing power, this deal? We, we think so. Look, you've seen what Amazon's been able to do on their ad-supported tier. Netflix is going to have great success in that space. WWE, again, three hours a week on Raw, every week allows Netflix to monetize this deal in the advertising space in a way that has not been seen before. Hey, Nick, Raw has this kind of super loyal and sizable audience, but there must be a part of this deal where you're like, OK, we need to think about the future and growing a new audience. And I wondered if there's any terms in the deal when Netflix goes away and produces a behind the scenes kind of documentary exclusive to Netflix that introduces WWE to that new audience. Think about like, uh, what am I thinking of? Drive to Survive and Formula One and the success that that had bringing a sport to a new audience. It would be a mistake by us at WWE to not do that with Netflix. So assume that what you said is exactly what we're all thinking. We being Netflix and WWE, you saw what Drive to Survive did for Formula One, as you just mentioned. We think the WWE audience, already big on a global level, only gets bigger with a show like that. And that's WWE President Nick Khan there speaking with Bloomberg's Katie Greifield and Ed Ludlow. Now you can watch us live and you can see our past interviews on our interactive TV function, TV Go. And there you can also dive into any of the securities or Bloomberg functions that we talk about. And you can become part of the conversation by sending us instant messages during our shows. This is for Bloomberg subscribers only. You can check it out at TV Go. This is Bloomberg. A group representing oil and gas tanker owners say the U.S. has advised ships to continue to transit the Red Sea to do so with great care. And that says the U.S. and its allies continue to strike at Yemen's Houthi militants. Bloomberg's Michael Heath has been following developments. And Michael, uh, suffice to say, despite the security operations going on at the entrance to the Red Sea, it doesn't seem like it's a whole lot safer there. No, and, uh, and I think I'd be uh, the, the shipping owners that we're reporting are, are very sceptical of the U.S. Um, suggestion to, to exercise great care. They're just avoiding it altogether. And um, frankly, outside of the oil tanker industry, which is obviously seeing huge increases in fees here, um, it's not really good news for anybody here. Uh, the US and the UK have conducted 
um, some pretty uh, strong strikes on Houthi areas. Um, they've targeted underground storage facilities and these sorts of things. Uh, but again, as we've been saying in recent days, it's, it's very, very difficult to get a handle on this. They don't have uh, boots on the ground. They're trying to do it all via surveillance. These guys are pretty nimble. Um, and the other side is that it's, it, the Houthis are being supplied by Iran. And it's quite difficult to interdict those, uh, those ships. Uh, the US actually lost two commandos uh, when they did interdict a, um, a supply ship a few days uh, recently, this month. Um, so again, it's a it's, it's, it's real needle and haystack kind of thing. And uh, in the meantime, trying to get shipping through there, I mean, sensible ship owners, as they all are, um, are basically avoiding it where they can. And it's not just the sort of present day shipping that is really at risk here, because we do understand that the US did have a sort of plan in place or, or, or projections to try and sort of counter China's Belt and Road Initiative. And we also understand that that's now been sort of stalled or, or pushed back quite substantially. Yeah, that's right, Annabelle. I mean, it's a, it's a really interesting initiative the US uh, and, and Europe have to, to have this uh, corridor, basically be a rail corridor uh, linking Europe to, to India, and it would go across the Middle East. And this sort of highlights the reverberations from this conflict. You know, Israel, very small country, uh, Gaza, even smaller. Um, just uh, just the, the global implications of these sort of issues where it, it feeds into US-China competition that um, obviously trying to build a railway or, or road connections across the peninsula now is, is out of the question uh, with so much violence around. But also uh, the, the whole project, um, which, as you said, was to, to counter China's Belt and Road, it was also premised on, on an incentive to Saudi Arabia to, to um, recognise Israel's right to exist and to set up diplomatic ties with the two, uh, that, that, that that corridor would go across both nations. Now, obviously, Saudi Arabia ha would have no interest in that while this uh, fighting with uh, the Hamas-Israeli war is going on, while the Palestinian civilians are, are suffering and while there's no real um, prospect at this stage for a Palestinian state. Now, uh, Saudi Arabia is ready to open a lot of doors on these issues if that comes to pass. And the US is obviously very keen for it to happen, but Israel has to be on board as well. So yes, this, this really interesting project to counter China uh, and that to, to open a new, uh, new trade route, a new direct route, um, is, is on ice at the moment while this conflict goes on uh, and until we can get some sort of political settlement in the end as well. Yeah, certainly need a lot more clarity and a resolution of some sorts. That, that was Bloomberg's Michael Heath there. Well, let's take a look at the other geopolitical stories we're tracking today. Turkey's parliament has approved Sweden's NATO membership, and that leaves Hungary as the lone holdout to the alliance's northern enlargement. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has already backed the move and is expected to give final approval. It puts Sweden on the cusp of becoming the bloc's 32nd member after a change in its defence policy following Russia invasion of Ukraine. Finland joined NATO in April. A Russian politician campaigning to end the war in Ukraine has collected the 100,000 signatures required to challenge Vladimir Putin in this year's presidential elections. Russian authorities still need to approve Boris Nadezhdin's campaign application before he secures a place on the ballot. Putin is seeking a new six-year term in elections to be held in mid-March. Israel and Hamas have reportedly agreed in principle to exchange Israeli hostages for Palestinian prisoners during a possible month-long ceasefire. Reuters cites unidentified sources saying a deal is being held up by differences over a permanent truce to end the war. The report says civilians would be freed first, followed by soldiers. South Africa's Justice Minister says upcoming elections have nothing to do with his country's move to take Israel to the International Court of Justice. Israel's denied the allegation that it's committing genocide in Gaza. Ronald Lamola, meanwhile, told us the case is not about scoring political points. There was no political consideration. We have been winning elections and we have been campaigning on this uh, matter of Israel and Palestine for many years. We have always believed in a two-state solution. But why now? But why, why now? I mean, why escalate this? I've now? already told you it's not now. We have been doing it all along. Even former President Mandela has done it. Mm. So it has been a long um, a, a, a project uh, and campaign. Mm -hmm. As you have said yourself, it's a long-standing relations between uh, the ANC and the people, say, 
uh, organization of Arafat in, 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 right. in, in, in Palestine. Mm -hmm. So they, they, there is no consideration of elections at all. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the, the fact is that there is an ongoing genocide which is urgent, mm -hmm. which needed to be attended to. It has nothing to do with elections. You have heard uh, we are campaigning here in South Africa, right. it's true. And yep. um, we deal with a number of issues, service delivery and so forth, obviously even international issues. But the matter was taken to the court on the basis of principle and on the basis of our uh, signatory to the Genocide Day mm -hmm. Convention. And I, and I also want to bring up, Minister, because there's been a lot of opposition uh, to this case in particular. We heard from the United States that called it unfounded, France saying that it crosses a moral threshold. Uh, Israel, of course, in opposition to it. I mean, were you surprised at just the level of criticism uh, that you got to bringing this case forward? Yeah, we're not really surprised. You're not the surprised. only thing that surprised us is that it was not uh, dismissed by substance, particularly by the U.S. You can't dismiss mm -hmm. an 84-page uh, document with just three lines that it, it has got no substance, it meritless, and so forth. They need to provide a compelling argument, provide substantive documents so that everyone can be able to see what is their point, what is their argument. It can also be, be engaged upon by both academics, intellectuals in the space, even the court itself. So anyone who has got a different view, that is what must do. And that is what South Africa has done. Mm -hmm. We have followed the rules of the court. We have um, uh, well detailed, forensically submitted our submission. That is what we expect. That will, will be what shows respect to other states. You can't just dismiss it with a three sentences. So it must be intellectually engaged. So we continue to engage with um, all the role players in the space and um, we believe that the superior logic is what must, uh, must prevail. That was the South African Justice Minister Ronald Lamola speaking with Bloomberg's Jennifer Zabajaja. Uh, let's take a look at some breaking data that just came out for Japan. We've had the trade balance numbers coming through from December and we saw a significant narrowing for the trade deficit. So coming in at 62 billion yuan in December, uh, that is significantly lower than what we had in the month prior here. Exports, meanwhile, we saw those rising at nearly 10 percent on the year, so an increase as well from November. And then also we saw imports in contractionary territory, but but narrowing from the prior month, so down around 7%. Uh, it was down nearly 12% in, in November as well. Uh, really that focus on semiconductor exports, uh, providing perhaps a little bit of a boost here to the numbers. More ahead, this is Bloomberg. We have learned that Apple is dialing back its decade-long ambitions for a self-driving car and delaying the launch for it. For more, let's bring in Bloomberg's technology reporter, Mark German. So, Mark, uh, Apple in reverse on the car. Why? That's a good one, in reverse on the car. Yes, sort of. Uh, their initial plan was to release a level four car, right? An autonomous vehicle that can self-drive with level four capabilities. That means the car can drive almost entirely on its own in almost any condition. They're scaling back. They're moving to something called level two plus. That's in line uh, with what Tesla has today, maybe a little bit better. And they're doing that because getting to level four, getting to these more advanced levels of self-driving and self-driving autonomy, it's very difficult, very challenging. So they're scaling back the ambition to finally get a car to market. The other thing they're doing is they're delaying the debut of the car. They had planned most recently to launch it around 2026. Uh, that's now going to be between 2028 and 2029. So a big, uh, a bit of a big uh, revamp or shake up here uh, for the car project at Apple. If they're delaying the launch to, to 2028, 2029, as you said, and if it's going to have this level two plus plan that's sort of similar to the capabilities of Tesla today, why does someone want an Apple car in six years from now or five years that's got those capabilities? Yeah, so there's going to be a big focus on safety systems, a big focus on interior and exterior design that Apple believes is going to be far superior uh, to what Tesla and other car companies are offering at this point. It's going to be a bit of a, a higher end vehicle. And you're also talking about a, a much more advanced infotainment system uh, and internal systems 
uh, the, the display, the, the gauges and what have you is going to be much more advanced than what you're seeing from Tesla. So there are going to be some key differentiators here. And there's a belief that 2028, 2029, four or five years from now, uh, you're not going to see level four autonomy or level five autonomy uh, being a big part of daily conversation, being a big part of daily driving. Uh, the, the belief inside the company is that level two plus is actually going to be where the industry lands in four years from now. All right, great context. That was Bloomberg's tech reporter Mark Gurman there. And uh, counting down to the open for Tokyo, Korea, some of the stocks are going to be watching world well, chip makers and suppliers of Texas instruments. That's after the U.S. company's disappointing revenue forecast. So it tells us demand perhaps a little bit sluggish. That's one group. Plus, we can also take a look at Asian streaming-related companies and producers of hit Korean shows in focus uh, following Netflix posting its best subscriber growth since the start of the pandemic.